again. My name is Bill Burns. I'm the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and I am truly delighted today to welcome Rebecca Listener and Mira Rapp Hooper to Carnegie, at least virtually, for the launch of their exceptional new book, An Open World, How America Can Win the Contest for 21st Century Order. Recovering diplomats like me are sometimes prone to understatement but even I can see that it's a vast understatement to say that we're living through a moment of profound upheaval on both the international and domestic landscapes. The era of post-Cold War American primacy is in the rearview mirror, and the road ahead is only dimly lit. Amidst all our domestic preoccupations, it's easy to lose perspective and to lurch from the illusion of neatly restoring our unipolar dominance to the equally illusory idea that we can just disengage from the rest of the world and focus only on ourselves. What Rebecca and Mira have done in this illuminating new book is offer not only a way ahead, but an extraordinarily thoughtful, historically grounded, eminently sensible approach to reinventing US foreign policy mindful of the limits of our power, but optimistic about its possibilities. Their strategy of openness marries the crucial importance of discipline and restraint with an appreciation of the potential of the hand that we still have to play and the number of other players, especially our allies and partners, who share a broad interest in a more open world. None of that should surprise us because Mira and Rebecca are two of the very best thinkers and practitioners of their generation. From Mira's perch at the Council on Foreign Relations to Rebecca's at the Naval War College, they've already produced together and independently a remarkable body of work on everything from the significance of our alliances to the role of technology and great power competition to the national security challenges facing the next administration. With so much to be pessimistic about these days, Mira and Rebecca keep me hopeful about the future of US foreign policy and their new book really is essential reading at this transformative moment. So I strongly encourage you to buy a copy if you haven't done so already and the link on the screen can help you do that. So I'll begin with a few questions and then in the last 15 or 20 minutes or so turn to your questions which you can submit through YouTube's chat function. So Mira and Rebecca, it's wonderful to have you. Um, thanks so much for doing this. No, it's a pleasure. Well, it's always good to start at the beginning, I think. So why don't you, uh, Rebecca, maybe if I could start with you, why did you both decide to write this book now? Um, is this a foreign policy response to the Trump era or would you have taken this on regardless of who was president? Well, let me just begin by saying thank you so much, Bill, for that incredibly generous introduction. It is such an honor for both Mara and I to share this virtual stage with you here today. Um, and of course, I need to give the traditional caveat that everything we both say reflects our personal views, not any institutional views um, at all. But to your question, Bill, our book, An Open World, makes the case that the United States needs to reimagine its foreign policy for a post-pandemic and potentially post-Trump world before it is too late. And we started this project in the immediate wake of the 2016 election, when it was already clear to us that Donald Trump himself was more an avatar than an architect of the massive domestic and international changes that were acting upon American foreign policy. Because even if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, she would have still had to contend with massive adverse global power shifts, rapid technological change, and growing domestic political dysfunction at home. So we set out to take on two pieces of conventional wisdom. First, the notion that Donald Trump himself was solely responsible for the collapse of American leadership and the so-called liberal international order. And second, the idea that the United States could somehow return to foreign policy business as usual whenever Trump would leave office, whether in 2021 or 2025. And the coronavirus pandemic has only tragically illustrated our central thesis, that a set of rules and laws and norms and institutions that were built for the challenges of the 1940s are simply not equipped for the challenges and the opportunities of the 2040s. So a new approach is needed, and that's what we try to set out in our book. 
Thanks, Rebecca. Well, Neera, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what the strategy of openness that you lay out so eloquently in the book involves. What, what would an open world look like or what should it look like in your view? Bill, I'll, I'll start by just adding my tremendous thanks uh, to Rebecca. It's a, a real joy to be able to share the stage with you today. We've learned so much from your work over the years and are so grateful for your support and guidance. Um, the, the bottom line is that an openness strategy for which we advocate is a new grand strategy for the United States that should allow it to secure its dearest interests, even though, as you so rightly noted in your opening remarks, we have lost military and economic primacy, at least in the way that were defined in the post-Cold War period. The objective of the strategy is to keep the world open and to promote interactions of the same kind. But what does that mean in practice? What are we actually seeking to promote? Well, an openness strategy would like to see states be able to remain politically independent and able to make choices free of political coercion. It would like to see the global commons, such as the seas and airspace, stay accessible and open. It wants to foster international cooperation and beneficial trade, as well as the free flow of information. And it places priority on transparent governance in international institutions, even if the states that comprise them are not always themselves democracies. Now that raises the question of, well, you know, perhaps this all sounds well and good, but what are we trying to prevent? What an openness strategy seeks to prevent is the hostile domination of geographic spaces in international politics or of functional areas. You could think there of a domination by a hostile state of part of a region, China dominating part of Asia, for example. Um, we, this strategy opposes foreign interference in political processes, such as foreign intervention in elections. And it also opposes any efforts to close off vital waterways, air spaces, or information spaces to free exchange. Now, who would we possibly be talking about in all of this? When you hear us talking about what we would like to achieve and prevent, the most central concern is that China is the country who could conceivably close off parts of Asia, achieve some form of hierarchical dominance in its region, or inside of functional spaces like information spaces, perhaps creating a closed system of technology through 5G architectures, um, or governing the internet according to closed principles. And the reason that we're so concerned about this is that a closed world is fundamentally less safe for the United States. U.S. economic prosperity and national security fundamentally depend on interdependence, both in economic terms and in security terms. So if China or anybody else closes off parts of a geographic region or a functional space, the United States itself will be less safe. But openness does not describe all of the goals the United States seeks to achieve in the world. There are some limits upon us. And of course, it does not mean that China or other states can't have influence. It's a construct by which we hope to govern international order while accepting that we're going to have to live alongside some strong and authoritarian powers who do not share our preferences at all. Thanks, Mary. Let me let me try to draw both of you out a little bit more on the following question. That is, you you rightly stressed at the start that there can't be a return to the status quo ante, either you know pre the Trump administration or back to what you know people imagine at least to be the heyday of uh, post Cold War American primacy. So, if that's the case, the thing I always found hardest in policy making, which is a business of choices, is what do you not do? So, or not do as much of as you used to think you could do or as you, as you used to do. And there are lots of examples, especially in the Middle East of, you know, places where we got so infatuated with our own magical thinking that, you know, we overreached. So how would this strategy that you've both laid out differ from past American grand strategies? What would the U.S. do differently? What would we not do as much of as we did, you know, in the first 20 years after the end of the Cold War? Well, Bill, that's such an important question. And you're right to say that grand strategy is all about making hard choices and clarifying trade-offs. So it bears acknowledging that openness has long been an idea that has animated elements of American foreign policy. But our strategy is the first time that openness really would become the centerpiece of American grand strategy. So looking back to the post-World War II period, 
In FDR's original vision for what post-war organization would look like, he imagined an open world. But once the Iron Curtain descended, the United States came to implicitly acknowledge a closed Soviet sphere of influence in Eastern Europe, and openness foundered. After the Cold War ended, the United States was at the peak of its power, and it set out to achieve something that was substantially more ambitious than openness. In fact, it embraced this idea of liberal universalism, or the idea that US-style liberal political systems and markets could permeate every corner of the globe. But it overreached and it failed. And in many ways, over the past four years, you've seen Donald Trump articulate a reaction to that liberal universalism, one that retreats very much from the core principles of openness by rejecting our alliances, by rejecting international cooperation, by shying away from American leadership and renovating the international order. So we feel that finally now in 2020, openness is an idea whose time has come because the 21st century international environment is one that is uniquely amenable to openness in a way that the 20th century was not. And it's a way to level set so that our ambitions are actually matched with our power. Thanks, Rebecca. Mira, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll take up Rebecca's great answer about the sort of um, historical and strategic underpinnings of openness and why its time has come and add some specific examples about what we're suggesting the United States would do differently under this construct. As Rebecca noted, it is this idea of uni liberal universalism that is fundamentally challenged in this environment. That is the idea that the world was moving inexorably towards democratic political systems and liberal values in ways that the United States could fundamentally promote and help to drive. Now, we of course believe that the idea of democracy and liberalism remains incredibly important and want to see the United States lead the world by its own example um, and continue to adopt those ideas and ideals. But we also acknowledge um, that we are living alongside authoritarian competitors in the likes of Russia, China, and others who are not likely to change the characters of their regimes, at least in the immediate term. And that the United States will therefore have to adopt a foreign policy and a set of strategies towards international order that acknowledge some newfound constraints, particularly when it comes to this idea of liberal universalism. One thing we're pretty specific in saying that we would not do much of is engage in efforts at armed regime change to transform the character of any given regime. Um, now, this might sound like an idea that doesn't have much of an enemy uh, in current day Washington because there are forces on both the American political left and political right that have strongly eschewed forever wars um, and definitely do not want to see the United States take on new military entanglements. Nevertheless, what we're really calling for here is extreme discipline when it comes to the American use of force for political ends in the international system. Um, and that is a big departure uh, from the first two decades of the post-Cold War world. Another fairly specific area where we do some need, see some need for change, albeit with very heavy hearts, is in the area of human rights. That is to say, we have to understand that these illiberal regimes with, with whom we are living alongside are very likely to engage in human rights policies that are not to our liking, and that we're going to have to find ways to address them that work through existing international laws um, until the people that populate those regimes ultimately change their character themselves. What we mean there is that we're going to have to band together with allies and partners to call China out on its human rights abuses, whether in Xinjiang or Hong Kong, on the basis of existing international law and international agreements, and do so on a repeated basis until China makes changes itself. That is, we're relatively bearish on the idea that we can change the CCP's approach to human rights ourselves from the outside. And again, it's with a heavy heart that we come to that position. Um, but we think that understanding that these character, the, the characteristics of regimes are fundamentally not up to us and will ultimately be a long, hard slog for folks inside these countries is part of the implications of living in a world where liberal universalism is ultimately much more contested. Mm -hmm. How do you think that the strategy of openness that you've both laid out, um, how does it look from the perspective of the Chinese leadership in Beijing? And how does it look from, you know, Vladimir Putin's Kremlin in Moscow? Rebecca, why don't, why don't you start? Sure, I'll take that one. 
So an openness strategy is very clear eyed about the fact that Russia and China do not share in our goals of international openness and that American grand strategy going forward needs to be oriented around precluding the possibility that either China or Russia achieves in coalescing closure. Now, let's be clear, though, that Russia and China are not the same threat and they do not pose equivalent threats to the open world that we propose. China is by far the chief antagonist to international openness. It is the only country that both has a preference for closure and the capability to bring that closure about. And that could take on a number of different forms. Closure could look like outright military dominance and territorial annexation by China of other states in its region. But it could also take on a subtler 21st century form, whereby China uses its technological prowess to coerce other states and undermine their political independence, for example, by coercively leveraging 5G digital infrastructure that is itself built by China. So an open world seeks to forestall that possibility uh, in the Chinese case. But looking at Russia, it sees a different kind of threat. Russia is a power fundamentally in decline. It has been for a while, and COVID and the associated crash in oil prices has only worsened Russia's position. That being said, Russia does pose a threat to political independence of our own, as we've seen through Russian election interference campaigns in the United States, but also that of our allies in Europe. And so the central charge in implementing an openness strategy when it comes to Russia is, of course, to maintain credible deterrence when it comes to NATO, but also to really develop the tools to forestall Russia's ability to suborn European states or, Amer or the United States um, by foreign meddling in its electoral processes. So an openness strategy recognizes the need, as Mira said, to live alongside a liberal Russia and China, which are not themselves liberalizing anytime soon. But it also creates pretty clear bright lines about the types of Russian and Chinese behaviors that the United States ought to oppose, that is behaviors that portend closure. And those types of Russian and Chinese behaviors that the United States ought to try to nudge in the direction of openness, but not oppose outright. Bill, if I may, I'd love to add just a few additional thoughts on China here. Um, Rebecca has has uh, given a great overview about how we think about Russia and China in this strategy. Um, but a question that viewers might have jumping to mind is sort of, how is this different than strategies that think of dividing the world along ideological lines of a free world strategy that sees democracies as fundamentally pit against authoritarianism? It is openness just sort of a rebranding of ideas that have become very popular inside the Beltway uh, in recent years? We don't think it is. Um, and that's for a couple of different reasons that I will illustrate with respect to the question of how this would all look from China's perspective. Um, number one is that an openness strategy acknowledges that some of the existential issues of our time are going to require us to work with China on the basis of mutual interest. Uh, we would point here, of course, to climate change, um, the need to tighten and significantly raise the ambition of the existing climate regime if we are to forestall the effects that are already upon us. This cannot be done without US-China cooperation. Um, and second, of course, the crisis we're living through right now, um, the COVID and attendant economic crisis requires far more U.S. cooperation or at least coordination than it has received, um, putting into sharp relief the fact that some amount of great power deconfliction and collaboration is going to be necessary, even in an increasingly contested international order that we have been describing here. And we'd also add to this ongoing cooperation on nuclear nonproliferation, particularly with respect to North Korea and Iran. Um, but a second reason why this strategy isn't simply just about authoritarians versus democracies is because we have on our face acknowledged the need to live alongside a stronger China and a willingness to work with China or other non-democratic regimes so long as they will abide by transparent international governance principles in their efforts to build international order. Um, so what do we mean by that in practice? We mean that if China was willing to bring its Belt and Road Initiative up to speed with prevailing international standards that create some transparency around development norms and allow projects to proceed um, without potentially miring countries in debt and commitments that they don't understand, we might be willing to um, work with China on those projects or at least help it to upgrade the standards by which it is proceeding. 
We mean that we are willing to work with mixed regimes like the Vietnams of the world um, in building new architectures to govern technology um, and the internet, so long as they're willing to abide by open principles. So the mere fact of a country not being a full-fledged democracy is not a disqualifying factor um, to that country's activity in international order. Rather, we hope that through open and transparent international principles, we continue, however modestly, to be able to shape some of the domestic choices that non-democracies may make in hopes of bringing them towards the advantages that we see of an open and interdependent world. Mir, let me just um, follow up a little bit that on China, because I've always admired your thinking and writing on, you know, U.S. strategy and Asia as well. So how do you affect through an openness strategy, the incentives and disincentives of Xi Jinping, of the Chinese leadership, you know, in, in all of the dimensions of that strategy. So diplomatically in terms of working with partners like India all the way across to treaty allies like Japan and South Korea, um, what would your view be on, you know, if, if you had a new administration about some form of, of effort to return to something like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, in other words, creating rules for economic openness that fit your strategy, but also would enhance our leverage in dealing with questions like the norms surrounding Belt and Road, because you can't fight something with nothing. Um, what does it mean in security terms? And on really thorny issues like the South China Sea. So if you could just sort of take it to, you know, one further level of practicality, how would an openness strategy manifest itself in terms of U.S. policy in Asia? A terrific question, Bill. Um, and in the really elegant ways you phrased it, you've, you've also embedded the answer. Um, we see that a lot of U.S.-China policy that has been made in recent years um, has largely been bilateral or, frankly, unilateral. Um, and a crucial change towards promoting openness is pursuing a policy that fundamentally relies on allies, on multilateral institutions, and on renovating the existing international order and writing new rules, um, which will ultimately and over time Time, perhaps a long period of time, help to shape China's incentives. Um, now, I'll come back to the question of security considerations inside of Asia in just a moment, because that's a bit of a different beast. Um, but when it comes to the approach to international order more broadly, we see this being a huge object of an openness strategy. That is that the United States must overhaul its approach to international order building if it is to uh, create an international order that can safely allow it to live alongside China. In some cases, this means overhauling existing international institutions that have all too obviously become sclerotic. For example, the WTO that needs its judicial appellate processes overhauled before its members can start to address issues like intellectual property theft and digital services, which are not covered by the institution, but which China itself has brought to the fore. And one way to think about overhauling the WTO is in fact the possibility of rejoining the CPTPP, which as a plurilateral trade grouping could actually help to raise the standards and fundamentally set the standards that would ultimately be adopted by the WTO down the line. Um, but in some cases, these order building efforts will require us to create new rules and institutions where very few exist. We're thinking here of areas like cyberspace, where norms are incredibly inchoate, or with respect to new technology, where there are almost no governing norms at all. Here is an area where the United States virtual unilateral disengagement from the global stage in the past four years has really been to our extreme detriment because China has managed to advance its preferred norms and rules for governing these spaces with almost no pushback. You can think here of China's efforts to advance its preferred technical standards through international standards bodies, or its efforts to advance its preferred norms of cyber sovereignty, which ultimately subvert cyberspace and the internet to the state in a way that is fundamentally inimical to American um, and allied norms and preferences. So by moving quickly to try to overhaul existing international institutions and write new rules where they are only just beginning to crystallize, the United States can take a multilateral approach to ensuring that China's preferences don't win the day. And ultimately down the line, hopefully nudging Xi Jinping to come on board with a slightly more open set of preferences. But in some areas, like the South China Sea or perhaps on technology, the United States is not going to be able to solve the problem 
through an open and multilateral um, set of choices that fundamentally aim at universal membership. It may need to rely on alliances, and indeed, I would argue, does need to rely on alliances to keep areas like the South China Sea open um, and to cooperate with allies to create the secure 5G alternatives to China's Huawei technology so that we can all remain secure while nonetheless having the next generation technologies that we need to depend upon. So while this is primarily a strategy that relies towards overhauling international order, it also recognizes that some national security issues must fundamentally run through like-minded allies and partners, and only there do we have the possibility of modestly shaping China's choices. Thanks, Mary. Just, uh, right, please. Sorry, just quickly, Bill, to really foot stomp and zoom back out and explain why this is a really different way of thinking about international order than the one that has prevailed in the post-Cold War period. Because the liberal international order that has been a subject of so much discussion, especially over the past four years, conditioned us in many ways to think of international order as a single monolithic entity. But in the future, international order is actually going to vary quite a bit in its scope, in its substance, and in its membership. And it's not going to be universally liberal, universally orderly, or even entirely international. So as we press ahead to modernize the international order and to build new norms and regimes and institutions to meet these challenges in areas like emerging technology and areas like climate, the U.S. needs to use like-minded partners as a focal point for building these new structures and understand that they're not going to be either universal scope or universal in membership. The future of international order is going to be highly differentiated. There are going to be different rules and regimes for different issues, and there are going to be different participants in each rule and regime. So what this is going to mean for the United States is a really vigorous diplomatic effort. Because we need to understand which countries, both democracies and democracies, share our preferences for openness on which issues, understanding that there may be countries like India that align with the U.S. in our vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific, but are a little bit more neutral in leaning towards a more Chinese or Russian view of cyber sovereignty, as illustrated by their own internet shutdowns, especially in Kashmir. So this is going to be a multipolar, multilateral effort that looks very different from the type of international organization that we've become accustomed to when the United States was really at the peak of its power. And over I think the past in that kind of decades. patchwork world that you described where diplomacy is enormously important, you know, as you've both argued, um, that puts added importance on, you know, um, not just reviving, but in a sense, reinventing some of our most important alliances, you know, especially the transatlantic alliance, um, as well as, you know, our close partnerships in North America, which, you know, in, in many respects has always been our strategic, our natural strategic home base. And, you know, here in recent years, we've accomplished the rare diplomatic feat of pissing off the Canadians. So there's an opportunity there, I think, but Rebecca, maybe I could ask you first, in looking at transatlantic relations, which, you know, clearly trouble if you look at recent polls that have come out in the last couple of days, a lot of our closest European allies and their citizens, where even a new administration is not necessarily um, going to wipe away their concern and their skepticism about you know, an American role that they may have taken for granted for a long time. So as you look at the future of transatlantic relations, um, how do you imagine kind of reinventing that alliance to fit the openness strategy that you've both been describing? Well, it's vital to recognize, Bill, that openness simply cannot succeed if we don't band together with our allies, because the geopolitical math is not in the United States' favor. We are declining in relative terms. But when we combine with our allies and remain an extraordinarily formidable force that can continue to tilt the global correlation of forces in favor of openness over the coming decades. And many of our allies and partners, both in Europe and in Asia, share our goals of an open Asia and an independent Europe. So the challenge going forward is going to be transforming those shared interests and shared preferences into coordinated strategies. And not just any coordinated strategies. These have to be strategies that meet the types of 21st century challenges that we're likely going to face. And many of those are going to be non-military in nature. So as Mira has argued in her excellent book as well, Shields of the Republic, 
That means modernizing American alliances so that they can actually leverage the core competencies that our allies have that are not always military. Many of our allies in Europe are technology powerhouses, and we've seen the way that the EU can actually set new standards when it comes to technology. So that's a massively important source of power that the U.S. should be leveraging. At the same time, we lack common norms and deterrence thresholds when it comes to emerging security issues like cybersecurity. So the United States has an opportunity to, for example, expand its Article 5 mutual defense commitment to cover attacks on critical infrastructure, understanding that we no longer live in the world where Russian forces are necessarily going to be coming through the folded gap to attack Germany in the way that NATO had originally envisioned. So there is great opportunity here, but also we shouldn't paper over the challenges because precisely as you said, Europeans have become understandably much more skeptical of the United States over the past four years. And our preferences aren't entirely in alignment. For example, there are areas of tech governance where the Europeans actually see certain privacy issues differently than the United States does. So we need to be clear-eyed both about the convergences and divergences, but understand that an open world simply cannot succeed if we do not band together with our allies and partners to make it a reality. Mira, let me build on, on on what Rebecca just said very clearly and ask you about, you know, the, the prospects for U.S.-European cooperation in two critical areas. One is in technology, because as you both have argued, if we're going to make progress, the United States is going to make progress to develop norms and standards which reflect openness. It's not going to come through some grand UN convention. It's going to come by us building leverage with like-minded states. Now, there are obviously a lot of differences over everything from data privacy to you know various forms of regulation between the European Union and big American-based tech companies, as well as the US government. But <clears throat> Mira, what do you see first as the prospects for narrowing those differences on technology, building genuine partnerships on issues like 5G, where you know, European countries actually have a lot more capacity right now than the United States does. And then second on China, coming back to what you said before, you know, it seems self-evident that you're not going to have identical U.S. and European or U.S. and German approaches to China. But is it possible to have complementary and coordinated approaches, you know, in dealing with strategy toward China? So technology and China in U.S.-European relations. It's a wonderful question, Bill. Um, and my short answer is that both answers uh, remind us of the fact that some of the most important alliance agendas that we will be pursuing in the coming years may not run through traditional alliance structures at all. Um, and figuring out how we take up these common agendas and where they are situated is a huge task of U.S. foreign policy and is an absolutely necessary first step to being able to make progress in either one. Um, so first on the question of technology, critically important. Um, we have seen, of course, over the last few years, uh, the Trump administration take a, a very sort of Manichaean black and white with us or against us approach to 5G technology, um, basically arguing that if allies uh, took up the invitation to work with China and Huawei, that they could be disqualified as American alliance and intelligence partners. But of course, the trouble with the strategy is that the United States was not offering them an alternative, nor did a developed alternative exist that could provide 5G infrastructure much, le much less at competitive prices to China's and nonetheless remain secure. Um, so I do believe exactly as you suggested, Bill, the United States and its European partners, as well as Asian partners, are going to have to work together to start pooling uh, capabilities and know-how in a relatively unprecedented set of private-public partnerships to build those alternatives, uh, to keep themselves and their network safe and perhaps be able to offer the same to others. Um, I would see that potentially happening through a 5G consortium along the lines that has been suggested um, by a number of international thinkers and leaders, including none other than Boris Johnson, um, but would probably include a configuration of democratic allies and tech leaders that doesn't actually neatly divide along any existing alliance lines. It would include some existing European allies, some existing Asian allies, and then some partners like Sweden and Finland who aren't part of NATO at all, but would nonetheless be critical to an effort 
effort like this um, and could potentially be run through a G7 um, or some other sort of ad hoc coordinating body for these private public efforts. But absolutely think that this is the way forward on new technology and alliances, this thinking about ad hoc private public pooling. Um, but second and relatedly on China, because of course China is the reason for this 5G concern, is a question of how we route our conversations with European allies about China. I think we've actually seen some significant progress um, in transatlantic perspectives on China in just recent years, whether this is um, through EU strategies that acknowledge the China challenge and seek to bring greater scrutiny to Chinese investments inside of Europe, whether it's the fact that NATO has acknowledged for the first time China as a challenge in its statements, or the fact that European public opinion, frankly, turned starkly against China after Beijing's incredibly aggressive COVID-related diplomacy in the early months of this crisis. Um, but the question is nonetheless, where we situate these dialogues and this partnership. Um, and it is my view that the best way to pursue these uh, diplomatic conversations between the United States and Europe is generally with the European Union. I think our European partners are likely to bristle at the idea of us over-militarizing policy towards China. And while it will be important to keep China on NATO agendas um, and related agendas, the best way to move forward on issues from technology to democracy to investment and other implications of Belt and Road projects inside Europe will be a really rigorous diplomacy through our partners in the European Union. And I think that's frankly our best bet on aligning our views, even if our policies aren't perfectly coordinated or even entirely compatible in the years ahead. Thanks, Mira. Rebecca, let me turn to another big challenge that you address very squarely in the book that you both do, and that is, especially in a pandemic world, and I know you started writing this before COVID-19 broke, but as you said, it's accelerated a lot of the challenges and and certainly the anxieties that you're, you're trying to take into account in the book. But how would you connect an openness strategy in U.S. foreign policy to the huge challenge of domestic renewal, you know, over the next decade or so? Well, domestic renewal is absolutely essential to an openness strategy because an openness strategy recognizes that the United States simply cannot succeed internationally unless we begin by reinvesting in the American people and their health, in the vitality of America's democracy, and in America's economy. So what that means is that an openness strategy internationally needs to be really closely married with a set of domestic policies that aim clearly at those domestic challenges and seek to rebuild American infrastructure, for example, seek to improve our healthcare system, seek to rationalize our immigration policy so the United States can still be an engine of growth and innovation. But another really important component of that, which I think COVID has pointed up, is the necessity of bridging the gap between the United States federal government and our technology sector. Because over the past several decades, you've seen growing estrangement between Silicon Valley and Washington, DC. And there are a number of reasons for that. People often point to the cultural disconnect that divides Silicon Valley's liberal or libertarian politics from the federal government and some of its national security imperatives. But actually, we argue that the deeper causes come from decades of underinvestment by the federal government in our domestic technology sector. We have fallen far, far below Cold War levels of government investment in R&D. And as a result, the U.S. technology base has set off to chase foreign profits and foreign markets at the expense of our national interests. So bridging that divide versus through game-changing strategic investments in issues like AI and quantum computing, through initiatives that lower the barriers to cooperation between tech companies and tech talent and the federal government, and also changing the way that the U.S. procures new technology can all help bridge this divide. Because as COVID has shown, our domestic governing capacity increasingly relies on our ability to leverage technology through things like contact tracing apps that serve public health functions. And unless the United States government can find a way to take its extraordinary world leading domestic innovation base and marshal it for the national interest, we are going to be operating tragically below our own capacity, both domestically and internationally. That's a really important point, Rebecca. 
Um, Mir, anything you want to add to that in terms of domestic renewal and the kinds of things in an openness strategy beyond those that that Rebecca clearly laid out, you know, that would where you could put into practice, you know, some of those ideas. Well, I'll just add, Bill, that I think that the domestic components of the openness strategy are actually what should help to make it credible in the eyes of the world. That is to say that after um, you know this obvious diminution of American power and the rather unilateral and reckless role that the United States has played on the global stage these last four years, our friends and partners have very clearly um, really been challenged about the future of American power and the way they view US leadership on the global stage. And these uh, changes in public perceptions will not easily be reversed unless the United States takes on the root causes of the domestic issues that are challenging its power on the international stage. And by making the domestic reinvestments that Rebecca is talking about, the United States can actually suggest to the world that it is doing what it needs to do to tend to its own existing capacity as a major power. And by so doing, we'll suggest that it actually may have the ability to continue helping to lead the international order for years, if not decades more. So by addressing these domestic capacity issues, I actually think we provide some assurance to international partners and suggest to them that they should have more confidence in the ability to get on board with this openness strategy, because by taking on these most central of domestic challenges, we may actually have the ability to make good on these commitments. You know, and I think just as importantly, as you both indicated earlier, the reverse is true too. You know, through a disciplined openness strategy, you're demonstrating to American citizens you know, the benefits of smart, disciplined engagement abroad. It's connected to, you know, taking on a lot of the huge economic and other challenges that, you know, that Americans face today too. I'll just add to that, Bill, if I may. I think that the COVID crisis uh, could not more vividly demonstrate the fact that foreign policy should be protecting American security and prosperity at home, and that we should be comfortable with explaining the role of our foreign policy in ways that fundamentally redound to the benefits of everyday Americans. Um, and I think that's going to be the responsibility of any new leadership if we do have a leadership change in the United States. That is to explain how foreign policy is working for the American people, and we do think that's an important component of this strategy. Well, we have we have a number of, not surprisingly, um, your uh, book and this conversation has generated a lot of really good questions from our, our audience. But before I get to them, let me ask you both one last question. And that is, you know, in the course of writing the book and now bringing it out and discussing it, what do you both think are the most legitimate critiques that you've run into? You know, the, the questions that people ask about, you, you know, whether or not this strategy could, you know, uh, run aground, you know, on whether it's international realities, whether it's a lack of domestic support, whether it's, you know, succumbing to the temptation to overreach and crusade, which has, you know, always been an important dimension of American foreign policy. So what, do you, what are the most legitimate critiques that you've run into so far? So I think the foremost critique that one could offer of this strategy, and in particular, the viability of this strategy, comes from the scale of challenges, exactly as you just said, Bill, that the United States is facing right now that have nothing to do with building a new international order. If you survey the landscape that even an incoming Biden administration would inherit, you have a raging pandemic that has yet to be brought under control. You have a massive economic crisis, which is still only in its early stages. You have a generational reckoning over racial justice issues. And you have a worsening climate crisis where significant swaths of our country are quite literally Really on fire. So the idea that even a motivated Biden administration could come in and pursue this energetic global agenda is a question that is begged by the, the scale of challenges at home. And so it's really a bandwidth issue above all else, not whether this is indeed the right approach for the United States, because of course we think that it is, but really whether the US has the capacity to engage in the type of vigorous diplomacy, order building, rethinking of its national security choices that we prescribe at a time when senior level presidential and senior level cabinet level attention is going to be consumed by these extraordinarily pressing crises. 
Bill, if I may, I'll just add one other critique, which may seem a bit more scholarly, um, but I think actually has some practical implications for policymakers. And that has to do with the limits of openness. Of course, we are advocating for international openness. That is an effort to keep um, international spaces open. Um, but openness in the international system and domestically does not exist without limits. Um, that is to say that, of course, the likes of China and Russia have long advanced their own interests by exploiting the openness of the United States or other democratic societies, whether in the form of meddling in disinformation campaigns and election interference, or through economic practices that seek to take advantage of open markets while keeping theirs closed. Uh, likewise, a critic might reasonably ask, is openness suggesting that we should keep our borders open to sort of unmitigated um, immigration and refugee flows. And of course, that is not what we're suggesting here. We very much believe that individual states will be able to manage their own borders and their own considerations in ways that allow them to keep themselves prosperous and secure. Um, but where exactly you draw those lines is a judgment call. What does it mean to be upholding international openness while still fundamentally taking the steps that individual nations will need to take to keep themselves safe and secure? Um, that in no way, in our view, undermines the international viability of this idea, but it does mean that the states adopting it will have to be judicious in the choices that they make and fundamentally how they protect openness domestically um, while still contributing to these order building international openness efforts. Thanks, Mira. Well, as I said, let me turn now. We've got a number of questions that our audience um, have submitted um, through uh, YouTube chat. And let me start with Cliff, who asks, how are other nations looking at the choice Americans face in this 2020 presidential election? And what, if anything, are they doing to prepare for what lies ahead? Are they prepared for a U.S. openness strategy? So a nice, narrow question for you both. I can take the first crack at that. So taking a broad aperture, we see there as being a battle underway to write the rules for 21st century international politics. And as I think our conversation has indicated thus far, different countries fall either on the side of openness or on the side of closure. So you do see traditional democratic allies like Japan and Germany that are themselves really trying to achieve openness in their regions and in the world, but are struggling to do so as America retreats. So for those countries, I think they're going to be looking for a choice in November that ratifies and affirms America's commitment to be globally engaged and to fight for this idea of openness. And especially after four years in which the U.S. has really been retreating and moving in the opposite direction, the choice in November there will be determinative. Meanwhile, we see states like Russia and China that are increasingly cooperating for closure. They want an international system that is friendlier and more amenable to their authoritarian systems at home. And there, I think they're, again, hoping that the American people will make the choice for nationalism and for retreat. Because if the United States can band together with allies and partners to affirm and advance an open world, then states like Russia and China are not going to be able to craft the international order that they wish the 21st century would have. And then finally, you have states that are hinge states like India. And I think there you're going to see their choices very much depending upon where the United States orients itself diplomatically and the extent to which the US engages in vigorous outreach. And for the in the instance of India, certainly its border conflict with China is pushing it away from China. But the question is, will it push it in the direction of openness? And that's a place where energetic American diplomacy and the attempt to take India's preferences seriously and enmesh it within an openness coalition are going to be really important. So in all of these cases, the choices in November are fairly stark. And you have a Trump administration that in many ways has been working at odds with international openness and is unlikely to adopt the strategy, even though in many ways it should if it's serious about competing with China. And you have a Biden administration which may be tempted to pursue openness, but will also be facing the major crises at home that I just mentioned. 
If I could, I'd love to add just one quick point to Rebecca's excellent answer um, and, and thank Cliff for a really good question. Um, and that is to note that while Rebecca is absolutely right, that we see um, the world in many ways divided in this battle, net, battle between openness and closure, um, the charge to friends and allies to even have to choose the side of openness does provide some newfound complexities, at least that they haven't had to confront for the last four years. That is to say, when the United States is relatively more disengaged and or is pursuing unilateral policies of withdrawal. These are deeply disadvantageous to the world, but they often don't force that many hard choices to allies. Rather, allies are sort of pushed up against the wall and try to hold the line um, as the United States retreats. Um, but if we were to pursue a strategy of openness, allies from Japan to Germany to others would actually have to take on a much more affirmative role in this strategy, um, potentially banding together with us in the South China Sea if China escalates tensions there or taking a stand on some of these new technology issues that we've been discussing. So these are in many ways harder choices for allies and will require them to be on board with the vision that we have provided here. But to our mind, this is exactly why it is so central that the United States does have an affirmative strategy for what it seeks to achieve in the world, rather than simply trying to govern amidst the many crises that Rebecca referred to here. And that is because without a vision of what we positively hope to protect on the international stage, it will be very difficult to convince allies and partners that it's worth coming along with us in the service of these objectives. That is, if everything is framed negatively as pushing back against China or defeating Russia's latest advances, um, it will be all the harder to keep friends and allies on board. So by having this positive objective, we do hope that openness will be taken up as a charge. Another good question from our audience related to what both of you have been saying is uh, from John Kenyon. And he asks, do you see China bringing the US and Russia closer together? I'm happy to take first crack there. Um, it's a really perceptive question. Um, and I think it's important because uh, the zeitgeist, of course, in Washington and elsewhere for the last several years have been has been that Russia and China are increasingly aligned, um, that they may have some form of alliance um, that is increasingly crystallized. And while this is possible, Rebecca and I, I think, are a little bit more skeptical of the idea that the Sino-Russian relationship is one of permanent amity. That is, by dint of the power shifts that are taking place internationally, we actually do think it's possible that Sino-Russian alignment could be more of a transient phenomenon. And we recommend that the United States not adopt policies that push them closer together. Um, so to back up for a moment, what do we mean by these power shifts and why they will affect the relationship? Um, first, as Rebecca has already laid out, we see Russia as a power that is fundamentally on the decline for a number of reasons, and it's unlikely to be able to reverse that decline anytime soon, while China will continue to be a power on the ascent for the foreseeable future. But of course, China and Russia are not just major powers on the international stage. they are also neighbors, uh, former allies themselves who went through a period of crisis in their own relationship, and countries that share conceptions of what constitutes their own sphere of influence and their backyard. Increasingly so as China moves through Western and Central Asia through the Belt and Road Initiative, it finds itself in what Russia considers to be its sphere of influence. And of course, Russia is now being supplanted by China as the central arms dealer um, in several regions. And as China's power continues to grow, Russia's role is likely to diminish in relative terms in its immediate neighborhood. So we see these power shifts as potentially provoking fissures between Russia and China, not necessarily tomorrow or next year, but five to 10 years from now. And what we hope for from U.S. foreign policy is that it will be judicious enough not to simply characterize Russia and China as being a monolith, a sort of set of authoritarian allies who are be to be necessarily opposed together, but rather make foreign policy decisions that perhaps might expose some of this daylight between them. Not necessarily trying to pry them apart. We're not suggesting um, some form of latter day Cold War wedge strategy, but recognizing that there are fundamental differences that are likely to be exacerbated over time if US foreign policy gives them the chance to breathe. Thanks very much. Another China question, this one from Salima Ibrahim, who asks, how significant is the US trade war with China and how can the next administration, if there is a next administration, using this strategy, de-escalate tensions? Uh, 
Well, it's impossible to predict what exactly uh, the next administration, whether it's a second Trump term or a new Biden administration will do with regards to the trade war. And I certainly can't prejudge that. But I can tell you how an openness strategy thinks about trade as an element of American grand strategy. And there, trade continues to be absolutely central to American prosperity. 95% of global customers are outside of American borders. So we really can't grow as a nation and become wealthier collectively unless we engage in global trade. But as Mira talked about earlier, the American workers and American businesses have been consistently exploited by unfair trade practices on the part of China, whether illegal subsidies to state-owned enterprises or forced technology transfer uh, on the part of American companies that are working within China. So the United States needs to lead in reforming a global trading system that reflects our interests and our values. So what does that mean in practice? Well, number one, in the WTO, the US and and China are both participants. So if there is a way to reimagine the WTO to, for example, include a code of conduct for state-owned enterprises that China would itself sign on to, that could represent really significant progress in cracking down on the unfair market practices that China is propagating. The problem is the WTO is a consensus-based body, and quite frankly, China doesn't have very much incentive to agree to a new set of rules that would constrain its ability to uh, maintain its illiberal markets at home. So as Mira mentioned earlier, what we imagine instead is a sort of outside-in strategy, whereby the U.S. can pursue new multilateral and plurilateral trade agreements that are themselves high standard and that encompass new areas of the global economy like digital trade that are not encompassed in the WTO right now. And by expanding the scope of what countries are included in those new trade agreements to include countries in Asia, the United States can change the incentives that China faces as it continues to grow economically and ideally nudge it in the direction of openness. Now, there are still going to be some areas where the U.S. is going to have to take targeted, tailored protections to ensure that its most vital technologies, for example, aren't exploited or turned against us to protect sensitive industries. But as a general matter, the United States can pursue a more open and a fairer high standards international trade regime by pursuing policies that do not just entail tit for tat vitriolic trade wars. Thanks, Rebecca. I think we probably just have time for one last question. And this comes from Fiona, who asks, with fragmentation in multilateral international institutions, how will the U.S. not only strengthen, but re-incentivize nations to revamp these organizations and strengthen their power? It's a wonderful question, Fiona. Um, I'll take first crack and I'm sure Rebecca uh, will wanna add some thoughts here too. Um, The first part of the answer is that ultimately many American allies and partners, and frankly, in some cases, even the Russia's and China's of the world um, are bought into existing international institutions. And while they might not all agree on the exact renovation agenda uh, that lights the way forward, many of them are uh, very much committed to the idea that the institution should survive. And that in and of itself is basis um, through which to begin renovation. When it comes to questions um, like how the United States will renovate the WTO or whether it should continue to consider things like UN Security Council reform, um, we see a need for the United States not only to work closely with like-minded allies and partners, again, the Japans and the Germanys of the world, um, but to frankly try to strike bargains with countries like India um, who constitute more of a hinge state in international politics. Uh, whose views of trade and economics may not always be firmly aligned with our own, uh, but who may be willing to come along with reform agendas if those reform agendas raise their power inside of existing institutions. So we see that sort of down in the weeds diplomatic brokering um, as absolutely necessary to any kind of institutional reform effort um, to bring the likes of India and other uh, international swing states on board. Um, But part of what we also recognize is that some of our existing international institutions 
don't govern the issues that we will care about the most, again, in areas like internet, cyberspace, new technologies. And we will have to build those institutions ourselves, making existing or rather new international order more layered, more patchwork, um, and less universal than it was in the past. Um, and there, we think the incentives are, frankly, for, uh, for nations to move quickly before antithetical norms crystallize. Because exactly as Rebecca said, this new form of international order will not be fully liberal, fully international, or fully ordering in the way that it proceeds. Rather, mutual interest um, spurs our interest in acting quickly uh, to set those rules before others do the same. But I'll toss it over to Rebecca for any final thoughts. Well, I'm mindful that our time is always almost up here. So I just want to conclude by really highlighting for everyone who took the time to speak with us and listen to us today um, what the stakes are, because the stakes are incredibly high. The US and the world are at the most consequential geopolitical crossroads that we have faced since at least 1991 and perhaps 1945. And the US faces a small but also narrowing window of opportunity to reimagine its foreign policy and its approach to international order before it is too late. And that means rejecting both Trump style nationalism and any kind of pre-2016 nostalgia in favor of a disciplined but also globally engaged vision of American strategy that is equal to the challenges that we face. Because America is still very powerful and so it can affect this type of change. And if we don't, we will see a world that is increasingly hostile to US interests as authoritarian powers and as China cooperate for closure. And we'll also see a world that is increasingly disordered because in the absence of American leadership, COVID may well prove a mild harbinger of much worse disorder to come. Well, that's a, that's a really important point on which to end. I hate to bring a fascinating conversation to a close, but I want to thank everyone in our audience for joining us today. And I especially want to thank uh, Mira and Rebecca and congratulate you again on your terrific new book, which is An Open World, How America Can Win the Contest for a 21st Century Order. I urge all of you to buy it and read it. Um, and thanks again very much, Mira and Rebecca. Take good care of yourselves. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Bill. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everyone.